Tonight's reading is 2 Peter 1, verses 1 to 15. So it's 2 Peter 1, verses 1 to 15. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tents of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. This is the word of God. Well, a very good morning from my side. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, good morning. Did I say good morning? Yes. The lights are bright. Uh, it's been a long day. But we rest in God's power, His divine strength, and so we will we'll pray together and we will ask God to speak to us, because uh, that's what we can expect this evening. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that we can come to your word that is so relevant to our lives and that speaks through centuries. And Lord, I pray that you would speak now and that your people would have ears to hear what you have to say to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love listening to a good podcast, uh, particularly on those long runs, earphones in. I really love that. Uh, There are so many out there today. Do you know there's over 150 million podcast episodes on different topics around the world? You couldn't even live a whole lifetime and finish 150 million podcast episodes. Uh, The best podcast, if you listen to podcasts, the best ones to listen to are those who are hosted by experienced people those who have insights into a particular area of life that you haven't had insight into, those are the best podcasts. You can find podcasts on parenting, on cooking, business, family life, running, what to watch, what is the latest gadgets, you name it, it's available. For me, this letter is Peter's last podcast series. It's his final series, his final words to his listeners in Asia Minor. He's hosting this podcast from Rome, can you imagine that? Just in his, wherever he's in Rome, he's got his mic, and he's at the moment Rome is ruled by Nero, and so he's writing sometime between AD 64 and AD 67. And we know from this text that it's his final speech because he knows that he's no longer going to be in the tent of his body, and the Lord has revealed this to him. And so some of the things that he wants to address to his listeners in Asia Minor and to us today, as he uh, starts his podcast series is that he wants us to be encouraged to know and grow in our faith and love of God. He wants to warn us of corrupt leaders. He wants to bring clarity to what the second coming is. And there's so much more in this letter that we can see and that Peter will mention. But I don't want to give it all away, right? You don't want to give it all away in the first episode of the podcast, right? You have to wait for next week. Okay, so Peter's goal in this series of episodes is to encourage us to encourage us not to lose our stability in Christ, but to stand firm in the true knowledge of God. And he's hosting this podcast as someone with great experience, someone who's finished well, 
someone who struggles with sin, someone who we know from the Gospels even deserted Christ, but also someone who knows the love of Jesus to restore and to bring life again. Clarence McCartney writes this, he says, His impulsive deeds, his frequent questions, his eager, ex- um, uh, eager confusion, uh, his sometimes manly and sometimes cowardly acts, his oaths, his bitter tears, all this makes Peter the great companion and great instructor of his fellow men. A great host of this last podcast. See, Peter has learned the joy of putting sin to death and making his election and his calling certain. And he wants the same for us here at Emmanuel. He wants us to be certain of us being who you are in Christ. And he really wants us at the the end of our life to say, we've finished well. We've finished well. So in this first chapter, Peter entitles his podcast episode as God's grace and power for a life of godliness. God's grace and power for a life of godliness. It's really his roadmap for Christians to live godly, fruitful lives now and for eternity. He wants us to thrive in Christ now as we live for him and as we wait for his second coming. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to know in this episode this evening that God has given us everything, everything we need to walk a godly life that honors him and glorifies him. So if you listen carefully, if you turn up the volume, you'll be changed. Your life will change not only now, but it will change for eternity. So let's, let's look at the introduction, his humble greeting to the churches in Asia Minor. Uh, let's look at, it, look at his, the way he starts his letter, verse 1. Have a look there. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a humble start to, the, to a letter. He is an apostle of Christ. His words carry weight and authority. He represents and speaks on behalf of the living God. But Peter doesn't want to flaunt his authority. Did you see that? What comes second? Apostle comes second. What comes first? He's a servant. He's a servant. He uses his authority to serve others. He has been given authority to serve. And in fact, he goes on to say in verse 1 that he, as an apostle, he has received the same righteousness through faith as they have. No one, including Peter and the apostles, have received a right standing with God based on anything other than faith in Christ and what he has done. A faith that has been received, he says, a precious gift from God. This is God's grace, a faith that has been given to him and to others, so they might be right with God. It's a humble start. And this grace and peace we have in abundance, it's not just a little bit of grace and peace, we have an abundance of grace and peace, Peter says, comes through the knowledge of God and Jesus. Have a look at verse 2 again. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. How? How? through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This knowledge idea will be important in Peter's book. It's the means by which God's grace and peace becomes large and powerful in our lives. And it goes on in verse 3, which we'll look at, to say that through God's divine power, all things concerning life and godliness are available to us through this knowledge. This knowledge is the basis in, in, in 2 Peter to, to stand firm in Christ. But he doesn't just merely mean an intellectual knowledge, a knowing of God. It's a knowing God personally and deeply. It's an intimate relationship and knowing of God through faith in Christ. He's not just intimate, he's just not, Peter's not just interested in knowing what we know about God. He wants to know do we have a relationship with him? Do we know him personally? Do we know him? And are we growing in that knowledge of knowing him? See, only this relational, deep, intimate knowing can be the basis of God's grace and peace and growing in godliness. Knowing him personally is the basis for all these things. So now that Peter has set up the scene for us, he now gets to the heart of his podcast. He kind of pulls the mic closer, and here it is. 
God's gracious power and promises transform us. God's gracious power and promises transform us. Have a look at verse 3 and 4 again. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Have you heard anything more profound today than this? God has given us everything, everything we need for godly life to participate in the divine nature. For me, this, these are beautiful and encouraging lines because if you're anything like me, I've struggled with sin this week. Even today I've struggled with sin and I haven't felt very powerful to deal with sin, have I? Have you felt powerful and able to say no to sin and live for Christ and be godly? No, I haven't. So we can't deal with it on our own, but this is a great promise for us. Peter says, God's divine power has given us not just partly what we need, but everything we need to fight sin and live like Christ. The way of godliness and of the hope for eternal life does not come within power that we conjure up ourselves. We don't produce this power. When it comes to life and godliness, we must have everything provided for us by God himself. You notice throughout this passage that it's littered with language of God's grace, His unmerited favor towards you. You have received it. He has called you. He has elected you. All these things scream, you can do nothing without me. You can do nothing without me. All language is speaking of God working in and for His people. And do you see the goal of, of God's divine power in us? The goal is that we become like him. The goal of this divine power is not only calling us to himself and giving us life, but to know a good life lived for him. He doesn't want us to stay the same. He says you actually cannot stay the same if God's divine power is at work in you. If God's power is at work in you, if you really know Jesus intimately, he says you will be changed And God will help you to change, and you will be effective. The means by which this power produces a life of godliness is through the same knowledge of God spoken about in verse 2. So as much as God is working his power, Peter is not calling us to be passive. Did you notice that? Yes, God has given us a divine power. He has given us these very great promises so that through them we may participate in his divine nature and become like him. This is paired with growing in our knowledge of him in verse 3. Those two things go hand in hand. He will go on to say in verse 5 and 10 that the church needs to make every effort as God's works in them. Make every effort. Does that sound passive to you? You see, if you want to enjoy participating in God's nature and his love and his life, enjoying the fruits of a godly life, he says your knowledge of him has to grow. It has to. It means growing in a richer knowing of his grace and experiencing a, a deeper appreciation of his free gift of grace and righteousness that you have received. It's growing in a deeper appreciation and understanding of his great precious promises that are all yes in Jesus. It's growing in a familiarity with what God has given you in Jesus and sitting in that and appreciating that. And all this love and all this knowing comes from having a love for God's word as you meet with God people and hear it from the front and interpersonal word of God. As we hear God speak to us, we know who he is. I don't, know, I don't know if you've just started dating or where you are in your dating relationship. Some of us have just started. Um, some of us are married and married for long. But when you start dating someone, the expectation is that you grow in knowing them more deeply, isn't it? Isn't that true? And if that knowing and growing leads to marriage, you would hope that you know them even more deeply 10 years down the line than you did before. And you don't stop pursuing that knowing, do you? It's not a passive activity. It takes time and intentionality to know someone deeply. This is what Peter is talking about. 
And as we grow in our knowledge and love of God, with God's power working as a current behind us, he says we can live godly lives. Godly lives that make, up, make us effective and which also assures us that we are actually God's. Assures us of our calling and our election. See, the mark of sonship and daughtership is divine power, and the mark of power is godliness. If there is no growth in godliness, then there's no true knowing of Jesus and no power at work in you. And later on you'll say, therefore, there's no assurance. There's no assurance. And you know, this, you know this to be true of your experience of your walk with Christ. As soon as you sin and you keep stumbling in the same sin, you keep rejecting the, the truth of the gospel, you start doubting whether you truly know him and, 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 and you truly love him. That's what happens when you, when you walk towards sin and walk away from Christ. You lose assurance. And for this reason, Peter says, make every effort then, have a look at verse 5, five to 9, make every effort to live a godly and effective life. Have a look there. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Peter will not have us turn our faith into an insurance, insurance policy while our lives remain unchanged. It's not like you, you put your faith in Jesus a long time ago and then live how you want. Don't worry, I have an insurance claim just in case he comes back or just in case you know, I've sinned a little bit too much. Peter won't allow us to do that. It is a mistake to think that salvation, faith alone, means that, our, that faith never works. True faith is a faith that sweats and that grows. It's how we become effective for Jesus. I sometimes think, this is me personally, you probably hear as well, that my growth in godliness and effectiveness in ministry will just increase automatically. No matter what I do, it will just happen. Almost like lying down and getting a virtue drip. I just have to lie down, God's working, don't have to do much. But Peter says, this is not how it works. It needs work. You need to supplement your faith. It takes time, it takes effort. As hard as you work, and being more effective in your family and your work and your student lives and for relationships and running that marathon, as hard as you work in all these things, in all these different areas, you need to work hard, he says, to supplement the faith that God has given you. Knowing all the meantime that God is working his divine power to help you to do that. You see, since God has given you your power for godliness, the command is simple, strive for godliness. If that is the aim of his divine power, isn't that something that we should be pursuing? See, we labor for godliness because God has already labored for us and in us by Christ and by his Spirit. See, these virtues in this section, I don't know if you try to start linking them, okay, if I need to start with goodness, and then I need to go to godliness, and I need to go back to knowledge. I don't think it works like that. I don't think it's a particular order. Like you need to overcome one of those things, then move on to the next kind of tear of godliness. But I do think these, all these virtues are summed up at the end with love. Love. So ask yourself, which of these are prevalent in your life and which are lacking? Take stock. Peter wants us to take stock. Now work at them. And praise God when you see them present in your life because you know that God is working by his divine power to, to allow you to do that. And then reflect why, why, why some are absent. Why is this particular area of patience not there? Take stock of it. That's what Peter wants us to do. Peter is helping us consider how well we know Jesus. It's not just about doing a whole checklist. It's about knowing Christ and living for him and enjoying the fruits of him living in us by his spirit. It's knowing him. How connected are we really to the source of divine power at work in God's people? 
This is what a life of true knowing and growing looks like. In all these things of growing and we're pursuing these things. See, true Christians do not stop pursuing growth in grace. They go on, they advance, they take the next step, they apply themselves with diligence in increasing these things, verse 8. Not perfection. Jesus is perfect. And one day when he comes back, we will be perfected. We're saying, know and grow in these things. This is how we remain effective for Christ in this world. And we know this because he goes on to write in verse 8 and 9, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sin. Our faith must be growing faith in order that God may use us to be effective in life, in ministry. Peter's saying, don't float. Don't float, but swim. Swim with God's current behind you. Swim. He says, any Christian who just floats through this life is never in the same place. There are consequences for not swimming and floating. To not be growing in godliness is described by Peter as short-sightedness. He's saying you have lost sight of what God has already done in you and what God is calling you to in Christ. The life that Jesus called you into has become a bit blurry for you. You can't see him as clearly. You don't know him as sharply. You cannot see the riches of what a godly life produces in its effectiveness. The clear knowledge of Jesus that you once had that brought life and enjoyment to you has become a bit hazy. You can't see it. In fact, you cannot see the rich welcome the faithful will receive into the internal kingdom to come. You can't see that far. You're short-sighted. You're only living for the now. And therefore, he says, he pushes us again. Verse 10, 11, Make every effort, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to conform, confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter says, be diligent. Be diligent in confirming your calling and election. Make sure that you truly know Jesus. Not just you know about him, or that your family has told you about him, or that culturally you, you think you're a Christian. Make sure that you know him deeply, personally, intimately. See, to drift into short-sighted, ungodly ineffectiveness is not just an indication that you've maybe drifted away from the Lord. It might be that you are in danger of never being saved at all. When Peter says, make every effort to confirm, confirm your calling and election, he means that a lack of godliness may be a sign that you, never have, you have never known him. You've never been called by him. You're not part of his elect. But the opposite is also true. If you are growing in these things and are becoming more like Jesus, it is a sign that you do belong to him, that you know his grace and his love. And you know that by his power, he's working in you so that one day you will receive a rich crown in heaven, not because of you, but because of what God has done by his divine power in you. That's what godliness does. It, it brings assurance. God is working in me. God is working in me. I might stumble, but he's working in me. Confirm your election. Make sure of it. How? How do you do it? By standing firm in your faith and pressing on towards godliness. Trusting that God is working in you. So how are you doing? How are you doing? Are you making every effort towards living a good, godly life, one that honors Him and, and brings worship to Him? Are you making every effort to increase your knowledge of God's character and His promises and His will for you? Are you making every effort to strengthen your self-control, which is so, so lacking in our world today? Are you making every effort to increase your capacity for patience and perseverance as you wait for His coming? Are you making every effort to cultivate godliness and affection for, for those around you? 
you grow for your love of those around you at Emmanuel? Is that true of you? Is that increasing in measure every time you come here? Are you making every effort to stir up sacrificial love for one another? Does love characterize your walk with Jesus? Does it? If these things are increasing in you, listen to what God promises you. This is not me, this is not my promise, this is God's promise to you. If these things are increasing in you, you will not be fruitless. Verse 8. You will never stumble. Verse 10. And you will enter the eternal kingdom of Christ. Verse 11. But if these things are not increasing, then it might be because you've become short sighted. You may have forgotten or have never known the beauty of God's promises to you. You may have forgotten or have never known who Jesus is and the grace and power that he offers you freely. Peter wants to remind them and us of these things. Don't forget it, verse, 11, verse 12 to 15. So I'll always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon be put aside as the Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I'll make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be reminded of these things. See, in the same way that he calls Christians to make every effort to pursue these things by God's power, he now says he, as, as, as a loving apostle and servant of Christ, he is going to make every effort to remind them to stand firm in their knowledge of Christ and to be increasing in these things. This podcast has eternal value. Can you see it? I'm so glad it's been recorded for us. Just keep re- 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 rewinding and pressing play. And if you're old school, keep taking the tape out, you know, taking the pencil, to, you know, putting it back in. See, God's gracious power and promises are there to transform us. Peter calls us to make every effort to swim and not float, to live godly and effective lives in this world and as we long for the next. And then just like Peter, I want to stir you up. I want to stir you up, stir one another, and one another up to keep swimming and remind each other of the great joy and privilege of knowing Christ and knowing his divine power, and living a godly life for him. There is great joy in those things, even though the world will tell you otherwise. Stand firm. Stand firm. Let me pray for us. Father, we know that it is only by your power working in us that we receive grace and the knowledge of you. Lord, I pray that we might not take this for granted, but that we might Grow in these things. Grow in our love for you and how we understand you and know your great promises. Help us to be people who are growing in godliness. And may that assure us that you are working in us and that we are yours. We pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to end our time together by singing.